If you ever feel out of control around food, you're not alone, and you're in the right place to learn practical, no-nonsense information about why you binge and how to stop. Binge eating does not mean that something is wrong with you. It's a natural but primitive brain response that you can correct. If you're ready for change, sign up for the Brain Over Binge self-paced online course for less than $20 per month. And if you feel you need personalized support, we also offer one-on-one coaching and group coaching. To learn more, go to brainoverbinge.com forward slash subscribe. And I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Brain Over Binge podcast, where you learn a simple, brain-based approach to ending binge eating. I'm Katherine Hansen, your host, and I'm the author of Brain Over Binge and the Brain Over Binge Recovery Guide. And my goal is to provide hope and practical help for people who struggle with binge eating. If you like this episode, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast on the platform of your choice so that you can know when I release new episodes. And also, if you want some daily tips and guidance and inspiration, as well as to stay updated on Brain Over Binge, please also follow me on Instagram. And you can find me at brain underscore over underscore binge. And I'll put that link in the show description. I didn't do much social media in the past when I started this podcast, but a few years ago, I committed to sharing helpful content on social media, and now I post every day on Instagram. And I'd love to connect with you there. Today's show is for you if you feel like you sometimes get in your own way, or you sabotage your own recovery from binge eating, or your goal of developing better eating habits. And this episode is also for you if you feel like your life sometimes gets in the way, and your circumstances sabotage your recovery from binge eating, or your goal of developing better eating habits. I have Heather Robertson on the show today to discuss this with me. Heather is the founder of Half Size Me and the host of the Half Size Me podcast. And she has such an interesting and empowering perspective about today's topic based on her own personal experience and her work helping others. I hope that listening to this conversation will help you overcome any behaviors or patterns that you define as self-sabotage and also help you keep making progress despite any life disturbances or challenging circumstances. Hi, Heather. I'm so glad to have you back on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I love coming on your show. Yeah, it's awesome. And you were here back in episode 71, which I'll also link in the show description for anyone who has not listened to that. And that episode was called When Weight Holds You Back, Reaching Your Own Healthy Size. And in that show, we addressed creating sustainable, realistic, nourishing changes in your life to allow your body to reach its own natural healthy weight, which is unique to each person. So Heather, this is primarily what you help people with. And you also help teach people to end binge eating before turning their focus toward creating realistic, sustainable eating habits that help them reach their healthy weight. So today we're going to talk about a related topic, which I'll get to in just a minute. But for the listeners who have not listened to our previous show, can you just introduce yourself a little bit? Absolutely. Um, I so appreciate being on here and talking to your audience because I was your audience for a long time. Um, I had battled my weight since I was a kid. I was put on diets at a really young age. Um, I had weight cycled quite a bit. And in that process, I developed a really gnarly binge eating issue myself where I could maybe be very rigid with a diet for a few days. And then I was binging for weeks, if not months. And most of my weight gain came from those extreme binge eating episodes, not just from eating normally, right? Just just from all those binges. And I was clearly seeing at the time I hit 30, after years of weight cycling, years of struggling with binge eating, going on and off all the all the mainstream diets and things like that, that my weight was at the highest it had ever been. Like I really focused on dieting for about 10 years on and off. And I managed to gain a hundred pounds from binge eating in that time period. So I, I went from like 200 up to over 300 and I'm like, I'm bringing a new baby into the world. I'm going to be starting over as a mom. I don't want to pass this on to them. And I decided at that point to only focus on healthy, sustainable changes. And I had always believed in my mind, I think, that when I could get to a healthy body weight, my binge eating would just miraculously go away. Like it was just going to be something that almost fixed itself. I didn't see it as being a habit loop. I didn't get what was really going on. 
And in the process of building these healthy habits, the binge eating was still happening. And I realized that that had to be a focus. Like I had to have, like, I created like a little post binge plan for myself. I started not trying to force myself not to do the binge, but kind of changing my what I did after it. And I started to build some confidence in myself that I was actually able to start making some changes to that behavior because I always felt so out of control. And I know you and many of your listeners can resonate with this. I used to feel like there was like this monster that would just come in and wreak havoc on my life and then disappear. And I had no control over it. And when I could start seeing myself gaining some momentum, like, yes, I could have a binge, but it didn't have to go on for days and weeks, right? I could, I could control the aftermath. I then started even getting better at feeling like I could dismiss it and start planning in fun foods on purpose. And it just was like this really good switch of focus to healthy habits. And then also learning that this binge eating thing wasn't just going to go away and I needed to start thinking about it differently so I could start moving it in a different direction. And over the course of five years, I got a much better handle on my binge eating. I got to a healthier body weight. I created much better habits for myself, but it wasn't a short process. It required time. It required a change of focus. And that's kind of what landed me here. And then since then, I created Half Size Me, which is a way for me to help other people work through this um, and podcasting community, all that kind of stuff came out of that. But that's kind of where my story is with all this and why I really resonate with your message so much. And your work has been so helpful because I push a lot of people toward your binge eating recovery guide and things of that nature, because I know that has to be the primary focus. The weight gain from binge eating can far exceed what you lose if you're in a calorie deficit. I always say it's like a, a boat, right? You got this big gaping hole in the side of your boat and water is gushing in and you're like, okay, I want to get the boat across the lake. Well, you got to patch the boat first. Yeah, you can sit there with a little Dixie cup and keep throwing a couple ounces of water out as you're going and maybe you won't sink. Who knows? But <laughs> but the more efficient way to get the boat across the lake is stop what you're doing, pull it out of the water, patch it, then go, right? And what we don't want to do is take it out of the water and patch it because we feel like we're not, quote unquote, making making progress. But when I look at the fact I gained 100 pounds over 10 years from binge eating, I realized it really wasn't helping me get across the lake. It really was weighing my boat down. I had to deal with that specifically. So I hope that helps, you know, your listeners have a better understanding. Yeah. And that's such a great analogy. I mean, it is so easy for people to think, oh, if I can just find the perfect diet, find the perfect way of eating. If I can get down to the weight I want to be, then my binge eating will magically go away when really the binge eating has to be the focus. And then you can move on to making some other realistic, sustainable, nourishing changes to your life. So yeah, I really appreciate all of that. So to move on to our topic for today, we're going to be talking about self-sabotage and also life disruption. So basically, like two things that people feel like get in the way of ending binge eating and also making these healthy changes. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm self-sabotaging. It's myself that's the problem. It's myself that's getting in the way of my goal to end binge eating or make some other eating improvements. Or they feel like, on the other hand, it's their life that's getting in the way, that there's so much going on, there's these big disruptions, and they aren't able to maintain focus on the things they're trying to change. So. Let's start with self-sabotage. I feel like there's a lot to unpack here. And a lot of people tell me, you know, I'm self-sabotaging. So I'm interested to hear your take on this. So I guess let's start with like, what is self-sabotage? I love this question. And and I'm going to start from a slightly different place where I'm going to say both of them are coming kind of from the same place in my perspective. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. I look at it as all being lower brain driven. And and of course, you cover a lot of discussion on neuroplasticity and brains being rewired. But we've got that little primitive lizard brain. I call it monkey brain, whatever you want to call it. And and I view that as being the self-sabotage because you have a higher level thought process. It's the same the same higher level thought process that suggests you might want to invest in your 401k. Or maybe you want to one day pay off your house so you have no more mortgage, right? Like it can see 
the long-term benefits of choices made today for future outcomes. It's also the same brain that will say, hey, yeah, it would really benefit me to lose 50 pounds, get this binge eating thing under control because I could come off my blood pressure medication. It would be easier for me to move around. But then on a daily basis, so in the immediate here and now within this five seconds, um, I always say impulsive behaviors are almost always coming from your lower brain because you have this higher level thinking that says today is going to be different, right? Today is going to be the day I eat my fruits and vegetables and I go for my walk and I do these things. And, and that all makes logical sense. And often if you say out loud, those sabotaging thoughts you hear in your head, it, you can hear the holes in the logic. There's no real logic there. It's just habitual pattering. So you come up on three o'clock, you've had a stressful day. You might hear the thought, oh, come on. You know, you've, you've got so much work to still do with this. It's going to take you forever to be binge free. It's going to take you forever to lose this weight, whatever. What's this one cupcake going to hurt? Or what's this one pass on your walk going to hurt today? You know, you, you, it's going to take so much time. And then it convinces you in this moment, it sounds like a good idea. And this is why impulsivity is such a problem because it's it's always coming from that lower brain thought process. But in the moment when it's talking to you, it said this like a hundred times before. You become conditioned to hear it, believe it. And then there's a cycle that comes after the fact. Whereas in the moment, if you had laid out a plan for the day, today I'm going to eat this, this, and this, and, and maybe I'll have a cupcake on Friday. What I've learned to do is to say to myself in the moment, hey, lower brain, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to take a 10 minute time out and see if I really want, I'm going to go do something else. Or I hear what you're saying, lower brain, but you know what? I'm going to have that cupcake tomorrow. Let's actually put that on the plan for tomorrow because every impulsive self sabotage behavior is only going to happen in this moment. Your brain isn't planning to sabotage you two hours from now. It's always impulsive and it's always in the moment. And it's always going to use some kind of what sounds like logical reason. Like you'll hear with a lot of binge eaters, I'm sure you've heard this, well, I started out really good today. I was going to eat adequately, but then I saw myself have a candy bar. So I said, screw it. I'll just eat the rest of the candy today. And then tomorrow won't be in the house. So I won't be able to binge. So it'll be a new day. That's starting a new tomorrow, right? That's a very cliche lower brain thing to say. It gets you to do your habit in the moment with the idea that tomorrow is going to feel different. But that cycle just keeps repeating over and over again. And and honestly, I didn't understand any of this, Catherine. When I was working on my binge eating, I didn't understand higher brain, lower brain. All I knew was there was a talker in my head. I could hear it. It would say things to me. And it always moved me in the wrong direction. Always. It was, it, and it was with money too. I had this exact same issue with money and, and I had to get out of uh, over $180,000 worth of debt. It did the same thing with finances. It would convince me in the moment eating the, eating out this one time wasn't going to hurt. What's that extra $5? But it adds up over time, right? So I just got really good at hearing that voice and saying, no, I'm going to follow my plan for today, but tomorrow we can do your plan. And mm -hmm. I would always push it off the 24 hours. And I kind of learned that from Dave Ramsey uh, when I was doing his, his snowball approach to debt. He would tell you, take money with you. You have a certain amount of currency. If you want to buy something that exceeds that currency, Go home, think it over, go back the next 24 hours with the money and buy it. But I'll say about 80% of the time you don't do it because you realize in the moment it felt urgent. It felt super like I got to have it, whatever it is. But when you sit on it for 24 hours, the mode changes. But with binge eating, and, and maybe this is true and maybe you can speak to this. I know a lot of binge eaters struggle because they think that urge will never go away. It feels almost electrifying and like... I can't breathe. I can't focus. It's never going to go away. And so they might really believe that tomorrow kind of will never come. And I would sit there some days and white knuckle 10 minutes, 20 minutes. But I knew if I could just make it to tomorrow, tomorrow I could put that on my plan. But it just was about not listening. And I always would do the opposite of whatever my lower brain would say. The little talky voice in my head, if it said, oh, you had a bad day today, just have the cupcake. I'd say, no, today we're going to follow my plan but tomorrow we'll have the cupcake. And I started hearing it for being a sabotager, but it wasn't me. And that's an important thing. You're not the sabotager. You're the one that wants these great things for yourself. You want to have the 401k so you can retire. You want to have the healthy body so you can enjoy your grandkids. 
that's who you are. This little primitive thing that's in there, it was designed for survival. It was designed to keep you going. And it was meant for kind of a different environment than what it's in right now. And and the way I see it is it's fighting for its survival. It wants to be valuable to you in some aspect. So it's constantly showing up, talking to you, telling you what to do, telling you how to go back to your habit. But what it's not realizing is we don't live in an environment where our survival is as threatened as it once was. So that's just kind of how I see it. Yeah, I I actually was thinking along similar lines as I was kind of preparing for this show and the idea of self-sabotage. Because I do think like you, that people think, oh, I'm sabotaging myself, almost like they're doing it on purpose in some way, like some sort of deep way that's hidden to them. When really most of the quote unquote sabotage is coming from these primitive thoughts, these thoughts that aren't really their self at all. So like you talked about, it's from the lower brain. It's not really what you actually want. So when you're following these urges, you could just put all this I guess, guilt on yourself and think, oh, I must not really want this. I must not really want to be healthy. I must not really want to stop binge eating. I'm doing this to myself when all of that's not necessary. What's necessary is to see that we all have this voice inside of us that's sort of encouraging us to do the things that are habitual, that are pleasurable in the moment. And it's about learning to step back and really connect with your higher self. Oh, a hundred percent. And one thing I would do when I, when I was really working my binge eating recovery, um, I would tell myself, so in the moment I felt that crazy electrical urge to binge and I would, and I had not planned to binge for the day. I would, I would make a food plan. And when I say a food plan, I'm not talking like you have to get in the weeds with calories or anything like that, but like, these are the meals I'm going to eat. These are the treats I'm going to eat, but there was not a binge written on the plan. And so what I would tell myself is I'd say, okay, I hear you. Yeah. We really want to do this right now. I get it. But we're going to wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow is a new plan. And and honestly, I think that was a big differentiator. I used to think if I was going to commit to a weight loss plan, I had to be like 20 grams of carbs forever, right? Or I had to eliminate desserts forever. Everything felt so permanent and long sustaining. When I gave myself permission just to write a plan for this 24 hours and tomorrow's plan could look vastly different, it actually let me eke through the 24 hours that I was in. And I would actually write out the next day what I wanted to binge on today on my plan. So I knew I had full permission to do it. But here's the cool thing, Catherine. (laughs) When you give yourself permission to do it and you write it all out, there is a part of your higher level brain that's like, wait a minute, like, I don't want to do that, right? But but you gave yourself full permission. Like that day I could have gone to the store, bought all the stuff, had it. But I was I was only making myself hold to my commitment for that 24 hours. The next 24 hours could have been a binge fest. And I gave myself permission to do that. And because I knew that that was available to me, it took a lot of pressure off to where I realized I just had to make it till I went to bed that night. And that was a totally different place for me thinking wise versus I'm committing to this thing for the rest of my life. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It's like you're you're setting yourself up to make decisions with your higher self and not just following all those impulses in the moment. One thing I want to ask about along these same lines is I do feel like there's some people who say, okay, no, I actually am doing this to myself on purpose. You know, and and I think this is, again, a little to unpack here, but there's some people who think, oh, I don't deserve to have a better life. So like I'm doing this because I don't deserve it, I guess. So I think that's another level of self-sabotage. So I can hear people saying, okay, I hear what you're saying about the lower brain, but no, I actually am self-sabotaging. What would you say to that? So so when this person's saying that, would I would dig a little deeper with them and say, well, what do you not deserve? And I would want to go several layers deeper because what you might find is that you have convinced yourself at some point, like that could, it's kind of like when someone says, I'm confused. If they say I'm confused or I don't know, yeah, you do. If we keep digging deep enough, we'll get past the confusion. We'll get past the I don't know. If you're saying you don't think you deserve this, is that you that doesn't think you deserve it? Or is that maybe what your lower brain is constantly telling you to convince you to go into it? Mm-hmm. Is it like, well, you don't deserve this? And and honestly, I felt that too. I, I, I had those experiences where I thought all those thin people, all those healthy people, all those normal quote unquote eaters, which I've yet to meet one, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but all those people I aspired to be like one day. 
I thought they deserved it and I didn't. And and what I realized was, is it was just a false belief loop that I got drug into. And your brain will use the same messaging over and over and over. And one of my big ones was you'll never get there. And even if you do get there, you'll probably gain it all back because you've done that before. It, it's trying to save you from you trying something wholeheartedly and failing at it. Because keep in mind, a survival brain, it's not literally about your body making it through the next day. It's also your identity. And that was a big shift for me. It was realizing this identity of Heather being X is what I become accustomed to. And I don't know what it looks like for Heather to be Y. I don't know what it's like for her to weigh half her body weight and have her binge eating under control. Like that's a scary thing. And if you think about it, there are people who stay in abusive relationships because they don't know what the other relationships are going to look like. So they settle for what they think they deserve. But it's also a big fear because if I leave this person, even though they're abusive to me, I don't know that the next relationship won't be worse. So that fear of I leave and I go out and I become this other thing or I move into this other situation it's preserving you to stay with what you know. And so that is a very lower brain thing. It's like, oh, this is her consistent normal. She's used to this. Well, we don't know what's on the other side of this. So let's keep her here because it's safe. And, and the way that you know the difference is your lower brain wants you to stay with habitual behaviors to keep you where you are. Anything that challenges that, anything that's taking you away from that, it, it is threatened and it will work very diligently on keeping you where you are. That's why I kind of say, yes, I understand they might think they're thinking that, but I also think that that could be a message that's coming there from their lower brain. And and because truly, if you were to say somebody, you don't deserve to be healthy, you don't deserve to eat just normal meals like everybody else or have a dessert, like, do you really believe that? Or is that maybe a safety mechanism you're holding on to because if you were to become that other person, you don't know how that might affect your relationships or your job or how you might see yourself differently. Um, my whole life changed when I lost the amount of weight I did and got my binge eating under control. I questioned all the things in my life I limited myself on. There was like a huge paradigm shift. And if I had known that on the front end, I might have felt a little bit weird about doing it because you don't you don't know what you don't know. Right. So I kind of question that thought process and say, dig a little deeper. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think the bottom line is like, just because your mind is telling you this and you're having these habitual thoughts doesn't mean it's true and, and start to get curious about it and think, well, what would happen if I started believing I deserved a better life that I started believing that I deserved to be free of binging? And, you know, it might not happen overnight, but you can start to recognize these thoughts as like you said, they're habitual. They're encouraging you to binge in the moment. And no matter how true they seem to be in that moment, like you can learn to let go of them. And I think just kind of wrapping up this conversation on self-sabotage, maybe we're not trying to eliminate self-sabotage, but eliminate the whole idea that self-sabotage even exists. Like maybe it's all just lower brain driven and we're not actually sabotaging ourselves. We're just falling for thoughts of the lower brain. Yeah, a hundred percent. One thought that I just want to share. I know, I know you're familiar with Amy Johnson and the little school of big change. She had done a podcast a little while back and it really was revolutionary for me because she talked about how the talking in your head is like one of your five senses, right? So you can smell things like say you smell a cake baking. You don't say, I am the cake. You say, I'm smelling a cake baking, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, I is, is the one smelling. And then she says, you walk outside and you see a beautiful flower and you say, oh, wow, I'm seeing a beautiful flower. Well, you don't say that beautiful flower is Heather. You say, that's a flower. I'm Heather. Heather's seeing the flower, right? But we have this like, and you can hear me talking to you right now, right? So assuming you're listening to this podcast, you've got earbuds in, you're listening to what Catherine and I are saying, and you can hear us respectively. You're hearing us talking to you. But when you're sitting on the couch and you're hearing a little voice in your head that says, I don't deserve this, or I'm justified in doing this, who is the person talking and who is the person listening? And a general rule of thumb, I'm teaching my teenage boys right now because teenagers really struggle with anxiety and they have anxious thoughts and stuff like that. And there's a lot of times why kids start eating disorders to begin with, right? Because they're hearing all this talk in their head and they're feeling overwhelmed and they want to feel better. And I'm teaching them anytime you hear talking in your head, it's not you. 
it's always coming from your lower brain because you can't be both people. You can't be the talker and the listener. <laughs> you can only be one or the other. So like you're listening to me right now, Catherine, you're not also talking at the same time, right? So you're listening to me. And then when you speak, I'll listen to you, but that's me hearing you. But then if I get off the phone with you and I sit on my couch and I start hearing, man, you really screwed up that interview with Catherine today. <laughs> Why did you talk about that? That was so stupid. And da, 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 da. who am I listening to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, where is this person that I'm supposed to, because it's your lower brain and it's doing what it does. It's trying to keep you safe. It's trying to say, man, you just really screwed that up. You shouldn't have said all that. People aren't going to care about what you're saying. It That is not you. That's what I'm trying to say. Where is that voice coming from that's saying you don't deserve this? Yeah. I guarantee you, you're not sitting there publicly saying, you know, the reasons I don't deserve this is because X, Y, and Z, this well thought out, put together plan. It is a thought that passes through you while you're sitting on the comfort of your couch or drinking a cup of tea and you just believe that thought. You haven't questioned it. Yeah, for sure. And once we start questioning it, we can change how we react to it and we can start to see that, yeah, this has become ingrained over time. This has gotten the lower brain what it wants. This has been a part of what's maintained my habit, but I can actually choose a different path. Yeah. And then I just wanted to touch on that one other thing you said. What about when life circumstances? Yes, for sure. You? And I think with seeing the holidays coming up and, and all that, one of the things I realized in my journey was my lower brain. And again, I had no words to put to this. This was just me understanding that my brain was like a little militant, you know, dictator of how things had to be. <laughs> it's like Heather does this every day. This is what we expect. What I had at the time was I had two toddlers and a baby all at the same time while I was working on this. And I realized very quickly, my life was not under my control. Like yeah. my kids wake up sick one day, people vomiting everywhere, tire blows out, we can't make it to this. Like things never happened according to my plans the way I wanted it to. And I could quickly make that my excuse for why I didn't do the things or I could have alternate plans, assuming that those things were going to go astray, or I could at least have what I called my minimums. And I created minimums because what I really realized about my, my lower brain is it only wanted to keep me at what I would call preferred status. Like if, if I make three square meals a day, every day at home, and I do three loads of laundry and I go for a 30 minute walk, it wants to hold me to that at all times because it's, it feels safe. Like this is what we always do life. This is how we live life, right? But then if some tragedy happened, like I've had a kid in a hospital, I've ended up having loved ones pass away in the time period I've been doing this. There are these shifts and ebbs and flows to life. But what I had to realize was my brain wasn't going to help me with that unless I had a solid written out plan. Um, I've noticed the way that I can really quick separate my higher level thinking from my lower level thinking is my higher level thinking will generate actual tactical plans that will actually say, okay, you're going to probably sabotage if things you know go astray and you can't control these factors. So what are your minimums? What are the few things that will keep you connected to what's important to you while life is going into meltdown mode? And it might be something simple like go for a 10 minute walk and drink a cup of water. But that becomes my downgraded focus when those things are happening. And because most people don't plan for that, they, they kind of assume everything is going to be okay and they'll figure it out when things are not okay. That's the problem, right? Because the not okay is a threat. And then the lower brain sees you not doing what you what it thinks you should be doing. So now you're getting somebody and they're talking to you about, well, just forget about it. You'll pick it up later. And so the habits all fall away. Whereas if you had a what we would call a basic plan of what habits you'll focus on when somebody dies, when the holidays come around, when somebody's sick and in the hospital, you know, real things happen in life. You have to have a plan for that. So you can go, no, no, lower brain. It's okay. This is what we're focusing on for the next six weeks while we contend with this. And then when these things pass, we'll go back to our preferred status. But we're not going to worry about staying at that because it's not realistic. And that was kind of a big shift in my thinking, going from type A driven perfectionist to two toddlers and a baby. The, those two things didn't mesh. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I had to, I, I almost think of it like creating a new, um, a new set of game parameters, right? Like we have to create a whole new way of playing this game 
if we're going to make it through to the end. And that was a huge shift for me to make it to where I could eke by at different times without totally losing sight of what I was working on. Yeah. I mean, I feel like all of that's really helpful because yeah, you didn't overcome this in a life that was perfect. And I don't think anyone does. I feel like life is always going to happen. And even if our self, and we're talking about the self, even if our higher self is totally on board, we feel really strong in our desire to recover. We're learning to recognize the lower brain. There is always going to be something that comes up always. So I think the more we can accept that and the more we can plan for it and be able to be flexible and have alternate plans, just the more we set ourselves up for success and realize that we don't have to be perfect. Oh, a hundred percent. This the reason I even traveled down this road of finding you and Amy Johnson and I even like Byron Katie. The reason I traveled down this road is because I said to myself, How is it? I wake up in the morning and I'm so clear on what it is I want for myself. But somewhere through the day, I get this idea and it totally sidetracks. And I became a coach myself. And I kept hearing from people all over the world at any given time, they were saying verbatim the same things. And you know this because you know you guys do coaching and work with people too. When you're hearing Susie in Oklahoma and you're hearing Ingrid over in Austria and all these people all around the world saying verbatim the same thing, what you really start to realize, it's not personal to them. They're saying what their lower brain is saying and all lower brains say the same thing. The content can change. It can be about money for somebody because that's their, their kind of soft spot, weight or food for other people. Uh, it can be other addictive behaviors. But generally speaking, they all kind of communicate in the same way. They say almost same cliche phrases. And when I could hear it showing up in so many people, I could get off the phone with one person and they said this thing. And then I get on with another person. They're saying the same thing. I'm like, wow, how are they thinking the exact same thing? Like you start to ponder that, right? And I realized this is not an individual person problem, like in the sense of not any one person's broken, not any one person is flawed. We all just have this little thing at the back of our skull that was put in us to survive. And it kind of is like a pre-scripted little computer that just generates the same messages all the time about different things for each person, but the same messaging. And it's more about understanding. It's almost like you need a user's guide for how your brain is operating. It's more about understanding how it's working behind the scenes so you don't fall victim to believing it. That's kind of how I see it now. Yeah. Like you said, we've seen so many of these similar patterns across so many different people that we've worked with. And, you know, we wouldn't be here on the show talking about self-sabotage, life disruptions. On the last show, we talked about when weight holds you back. Like these are universal factors that come up, you know, across the board. So the more we can see that, the more we can see, like you said, that it's not personal, the more we can start to take steps to live the life we want without these factors getting in the way. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Like if you can hear the messaging and go, oh, that's just my lower brain talking to me. I'll take that seriously. I, I use this example. I've done a video on this where I say it's kind of like your phone rings and you look down at see the caller ID and you see, OK, it's a solicitor. Most people don't run across the room, grab the phone, flip it open and say, yes, please tell me what you're selling. I have my credit card at hand. I can't wait to hear what you're saying. And if your best friend were to call, we would expect to see that response. It's kind of like your lower brain is the solicitor. And every time it talks to you, you're going, yes, please tell me what I'm doing wrong. Please tell me what I need to do right now. And the more that you can kind of let it go to voicemail or you can let it just kind of, you know, you can like put it on silent, <laughs> the better you're going to be. And again, just ask yourself a simple question. Who is doing the talking? If I can hear it, and we all would agree that that all these external things you see, you hear, you smell, you know, you're the one observing all that. Then when you hear talking in your own head, who's the one hearing that and who's the one doing the talking? And when I could see these were two separate things existing in the same space and I could see that this was happening, it became so much easier to just kind of ignore it. Like I can still hear it but it's not screaming right behind me. It's like maybe in another room with the door shut, I can hear it, but I don't have to take it seriously. 
Yeah. And then you're free to make your own choices. You you stop being so blindly driven by that voice and you get to direct your own life. Now that doesn't mean you will always direct it perfectly. Like you said, there's no such thing as a normal eater and you know, none of us are going to be perfect, but you actually get to choose with your higher self. Again, never going to make the perfect choices, but you, you get to stop letting these things like self-sabotage, like life disruptions, like issues with your weight. You get to stop letting these things hold you back. Oh, a hundred percent. I'll never tell somebody your real life situations aren't happening. Like yeah. you go to pull money out of your bank account and there's zero dollars. Well, there's zero dollars, right? I mean, it it is reality, but it's the way that you think about it and the and the thoughts you choose to take seriously. And honestly, noticing your own patterns, like noticing the way it shows up for you when you've had a bad day at work, noticing the way it shows up for you when you're getting overstressed. And then what you can kind of start to even do is is take it to another level where you're not just observing it and kind of refocusing yourself, but where you're actually saying, you know what, that situation normally produces a lot of stress for me. And I know my brain gets super talkative when that happens. So I'm actually going to either put some breaks into that day, or I'm just going to opt out of that situation this time, because I know typically that that will lead me to feeling that way. You slow your thinking down enough and you become so self-aware enough to be able to guess what things might lead you down that road. And you can sometimes circumvent certain situations and and, uh, moments that will lead to that. Like I know for me, if I overschedule myself, I start to feel really anxious And that's when food becomes more appealing because I've overscheduled myself. So I've stopped doing that like on purpose, right? And it's just becoming more aware of how it's communicating with you and what things tend to bring that communication out. Yeah, absolutely. And for people who are struggling with binge eating, I think it can be really helpful. Like when you're first learning these skills about your thinking and about, you know, the primal voice in your head to zero in on any thought, feeling, physical sensation that encourages binging is your lower brain. And that can start helping you get that separation. So I define an urge to binge as just that, any thought, feeling, physical sensation that encourages a binge. So when you have these excuses or justifications or rationalizations in your head, blaming yourself or your life or different factors, well, is it encouraging you to binge? it is, well, then that's your lower brain. That's the voice you need to start to separate from. And as you separate from it in relationship to binge eating, then you can start to separate from it in other parts of your life as well. Yeah. And one thing I've noticed, and I don't know if you've picked up on this. So for me, the real urge to binge was kind of like a manifestation of a lot of other chitter chatter that was going on in my head. It might start out with, man, today was a rough day at work. And -and so-and-so really was was crappy to me. And it might start on that level. And then what would happen over time is I would then kind of fixate on that story. I'm hearing, I'm hearing my narrator talking to me. I'm hearing the story. It's starting to make me feel agitated. And then it keeps escalating and then it lands on the bench. And what I started to notice was there was like this pattern that was often leading me into it. So sometimes if I could start to observe those connections, when it would start about the crappy day, I could be like, yeah, that might have happened. But what am I going to do about tomorrow differently? Like I could interrupt that flow of thought. But that took me a while to realize that. I was landing on the binge because of how I was, quote unquote, feeling like agitated, anxious, sad, whatever. But that was kind of coming from the habitual story that was coming up over and over and over again. So I often see it as it's it's weird. It's like it kind of starts for me anyway. It starts with the story of what's happening, like your narrator story, and then it evokes this feeling or emotional state. And then from that, it would lead to the binge or desire to overeat. And if I could see where it was going, it was easier to, you know, to, to kind of shut that down earlier and make it easier. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a great tip for people because sometimes when people are at the point where they're already feeling so driven to eat, it feels like it's almost too late and it's never too late, but it it can feel that way at first. So the more you can recognize your, your own patterns, the more you can recognize how your thoughts are leading from, you know, certain thoughts about your life or about yourself or about your situation to then urges to overeat or binge the more you can kind of stop the process, the more you can redirect your thoughts much earlier. And then it just all becomes a little easier. Yeah. And that might take a long time to get to, by the way, like it might take several times of having a binge 
before you start to notice, wow, you know, I'm seeing this little bit of a pattern emerging here. And the problem is where I think the great opportunity is, is it's post binge to, to kind of start to see that. But often people are so steeped in guilt and shame and beating themselves up for having done it. They're losing the learning opportunity, right? They're losing that ability to reflect and say, okay, I've, I've listened to what Catherine's been saying. I'm listening to what Heather's been saying. I know there's probably a thought pattern here that's, that's escalating to this point, but I really want to start becoming aware of that. That means sometimes you have to check the shame and guilt and the, and the self-loathing and beating yourself up and say, okay, I don't have space for that anymore. I've been spending a lot of time doing that and it's not getting me where I want to go. So what if I take a learning mindset where I say, I want to better understand what's happening that's bringing me to this point. And I'm curious because if you can come at this with curiosity and you can come at it with a willingness to learn and fall down and get back up and make mistakes and stop beating yourself up. And that's kind of that neutral place is where I was with my post binge plan that allowed me to really start to work on this because for years I was so rough on myself and it would continue the cycle going. But when I finally said, no, I want to understand what's going on here. I want to stop it in its tracks after the fact. I want to get better at being able to avoid binge eating. I need to stop looking at this with critical eyes and more with curiosity. And that was a game changer. Yes, absolutely. And I think just to kind of wrap up this this part about the life disruptions is that maybe when you look at that and when you start to analyze your thoughts, you might see things that you do want to adjust in your life to set yourself up for success. We want you to get to a point where you feel like you can avoid a binge in any situation, but if there are certain things you need to shift or adjust or change or get support for in your life, absolutely. So we're not saying don't get help for any of your other problems. We're just encouraging you to notice the thought processes behind it as well. Oh, yeah. And in there, I had therapy, too. I, I just needed to go see somebody and share with them what had happened in my own childhood because I needed to tell somebody who was a third party who wouldn't judge me for it, who who would be detached. And that was a huge freeing moment. So there is a place for everything in this. I, and that's the other thing, too realize your lower brain is going to say black and white. Well, they said this, so that's what I need to do. Maybe, maybe not, right? Like take the nuggets that apply to you, be willing to try different things and also be willing to do things that like in this case, I did therapy. I, I did all these different things and I worked with what I had at the time. You can go from where you are right now to a better place just by focusing on what you're doing now and making whatever improvements you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I think that's another sabotage thing where it's like, we think we have to cross all the T's and dot all the I's and we have to follow a pattern that someone else has laid out for us. But I'll tell you now, that's that's not what got me where I'm at. It was a lot of falling down, a lot of mistakes. It was a lot of trying different things at different times. But I never gave up my willingness to test things and I never gave up my willingness to learn and I never gave up my willingness to be patient because I knew I could get to that other place. And I think that is really what I want to deliver today, that that you are not broken, that you can totally do this, but you don't have to have a perfectly laid out plan to do it. Fall down, get back up, move forward, but be willing to fall down again tomorrow and just say, what can I change today based on what I'm hearing and make some improvements on and realize you're circling around the same problem over and over again. But every time you do, you gain some more knowledge and some more perspective you didn't have the day before. Yeah, that's so great. Thank you so much, Heather, for all of that. I think this has been a great discussion on some factors that can hold us back. And then also we gave people solutions to, you know, mitigate those factors by looking at our thoughts and also by getting whatever extra help that they need. Absolutely. Can you um, explain to people how they can learn more about you? Yeah, just go to halfsizeme.com. Uh, we have a podcast. If you really like the podcast, there is a paid for version. It's a podcast premium and that's halfsizeme.com forward slash fam, but you can find everything at Half Size Me. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. Thank you so much for having me. I've included links to Heather's information in the show description. There you will also find the Brain Over Binge resources, including my books, the online course, and one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching. If you're new here and new to the Brain Over Binge approach, know that there is also a link in the show description to get my free ebook, The Brain Over Binge Basics, which will take you through all of the fundamentals of this approach and help you start avoiding binges. It's been great being with you today. 
I hope you can put the ideas that you learned into practice, and I want to encourage you and remind you that you have the power to change your brain and live a binge-free life. The Brain Over Binge podcast is produced and recorded by Brain Over Binge Recovery Coaching, LLC. All work is copyrighted by Brain Over Binge Recovery Coaching, LLC, and all rights are reserved. As a disclaimer, the hosts of the Brain Over Binge podcast are not professional counselors or licensed healthcare providers, and this podcast is not a substitute for medical advice or any form of professional therapy. Eating disorders can have serious health consequences, and you are strongly advised to seek medical attention for matters relating to your health. Please get help when you need it, and good luck on your journey. Need more help? You can find all of our current and upcoming options for support at brainoverbinge.com.